Howdy. So, something a little bit special today. I've got this on loan from uh, Aussie 50, uh, Ed. There's a, a bit of a special teardown. It's fairly old now. This is an old uh, half height, five and a quarter inch MFM hard drive. Uh, rather old. Um, so I'll pull this one apart and go through what's different with this compared to uh, more modern drives. Um, now, I have noticed I have passed 500 viewers now. Uh, I am planning a 500 viewer special. I'm hoping I get what I want for this special. Uh, I'll know by Thursday night, and if I get it, we're going to have a fairly old piece of technology to do a teardown on. And I'm going to repair it because it will be added to my collection of computers that very few people know how to drive anymore. Right, getting off traffic here. Traffic getting off topic here. Uh, this uses an interface, I'll flip it over, uh, this is an interface known as ST504 because the, at the time, named Shugart Technologies Company, now known as Seagate, uh, built a drive called the ST504, first drive to use this, and it became a bit of a de facto standard. Um, that this side is control, this side is data. Uh, control is very similar to a floppy drive controller. Um, that's where it originally came from. So over here you've got lines for drive select. Uh, that's the only one I remember off the top of my head. But there's drive select and a few other... Con oh, and step. Step is done over here. Uh, basically drive select, step, and whatever else they needed, which wasn't a heck of a lot. Uh, this just had data in, data read, data write, MFM read, MFM write, and that's all that came out of this one. Uh, from the control side, you could chain all, up to four discs off the controller up that one, but the controller had to have a separate connector. You could not chain data, uh, which is a bit odd, but it worked at the time. So first thing, uh, I'll, I'll take the lid off. I'm not going to pull this to too many pieces because... I'd have to put it back together the way it came apart. Not as easy as it sounds with these older ones. They were rather fiddly. Even though they're bigger than a modern drive, I wouldn't try. So we'll just get all these held together really well at the time too. Um, while I do have the lid on, I can't remove screws while talking about it. This sticker here has what's called the defective area table. And basically, as the label says, defective areas as shipped. And it has a cylinder head and a byte. Uh, basically, you program them into the controller to tell it where the bad sectors were on disk. Because no disk platter is made perfect. They do a media test when they're manufactured. And then they've got a bad, a, a bad track table, essentially. Uh, modern drives are the same. You just don't have the table on the disk anymore. Because it's all programmed into the flash ROM on the drive when it's shipped. Uh, it's part of calibration information, which is why switching the logic board on a modern drive simply doesn't work. Because the replacement logic board has the wrong calibration information and the disk just can't self-test. Right, so we'll pop this open. Well, we'll try to pop this open. It's some... some Pretty epic ceiling. I'll go find something to lever it with. Right, I've got some tools to help me convince this drive that it really, really, really wants to open up for us. I don't know how much luck I'll have. No, nope, not from that angle. That angle? No. Nope. Wow, well, this is. They used some good gasket stuff back then. This disc is life proof, really. It's just the sort of hard drive I want in my computer in the zombie apocalypse because it just won't die. Right, there we go. Got it. So again, huge five and a quarter inch platter. There's two of them with four heads. Uh, as you see, the heads are absolutely massive. The sectors are huge on discs like this. Uh, this drive doesn't have a model number. 
that it sounds about right. It'd only be 20, maybe 30 meg, 40 if you were really lucky. That would have cost a fortune at the time. So stepper motor driven, so step don't even know if I'm really gonna see the heads move. Step, 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 step. That stepped all the way in. Everything from there forward on the platter is just unused area. The seven minute motor really doesn't go that far. So as you see, step out, step in. Uh, basically, the platters are an orange color because the material used at the time these were made was iron oxide. That was the magnetic recording material of choice. For those who know what iron oxide is, or don't know, sorry, it's essentially rust. So it's a layer of rust. Used to record your data on rust. Uh, let's just turn it on. I believe it's only 3600 RPM, if not a bit slower. So I'll turn it on and see how it sounds. The click was the brake disengaging. Top head's a bit unhappy. Yes, so I turn it off, you'll hear the braking gauge. That's just to get the platters to stop quicker. So when it's turned on, the brake disengages. And if you try and turn it, you can actually feel the brake in there. It's a fairly heavy brake. Just, just to stop the thing taking too long. Uh, this one has an auto park feature. As you notice when I turned it up, the head came back in automatically to the center. Um, that's actually done by the... The platter's acting as a flywheel on the motor to generate power for long enough for the heads to come in and then the brake to automatically engage when, when the heads are in to stop it. Right, so I'll put its hat back on because I don't want to try this with the hat off and we'll pull apart the logic board. Gotta reset the camera. So just as a note while I'm reassembling the drive casing, because this will take a minute. Um, now in my first hard drive video I talked about zone bit recording and sectors more or less being equal in size as you go up the disc. Uh, this being an MFM disc, that is not the case. The sectors, basically the lines going out are even, so the sectors at the ed outer edge of the disc are a lot bigger than the sectors on the inner edge of the disc. Uh, it was a bit of a waste of space, these discs could have been bigger, but zone bit recording didn't exist back then, so not a lot that could really be done. Um, yeah, so no zone bit recording, dumb controller, looked that brilliant at the time. You, know, you store store all your all your uh, word processing documents on this magical thing and it would hold you know 10 million type characters that was wonderful no floppy disks floppy disks died these you could low level format as long as you backed up your data on the floppy disks and hopefully when you restored said floppy disks it was all good right let's flip it over get into the logic side didn't have screws for the bottom, so I found three that fit. Right, so, just got to leave at this board off here, disconnect it from the head assembly. So, we'll come back to that one. This is the main logic board, and for the fact it's got more chips than an IDE drive, it's actually quite stupid. Um, I can't remove that shield, unfortunately. So here's your terminator for, I uh, believe it's this side. Uh, like SCSI, stop signals reflecting up and down the wire. Uh, jumpers, uh, not jumpers, but switch block to let you configure you know, whether which drive select it responds to, whether it be 0, 1, 2, or 3. Uh, this is an interesting thing you don't see on modern drives. This is a little grounding brush. I'll point out the bearing on the top of the motor it sits on. It stops the platters picking up a static charge and making a mess of things. Uh, evidently back then we used to get a bit of a static charge, which makes sense. Uh, the motors were a lot bigger. So this is actually quite a stupid board. Uh, all the smarts were in the hard drive controller. 
ultimately the card, the paired card that went into the computer. Uh, when IDE came about, they took the contents of that, that card that's paired with it and all this logic on these discs, put it all into a unit with one forty pin connector on the back and said, have a nice day, people. We've just made your life simpler. Um, so yeah, this is the main logic board. It responds to stepping the motors, making the disc spin, keeping the disc spin or RPM of the discs done on this one. So we have here, so here's the motor, here's the brake. The brake's just a, a, a solenoid here. It just pops out and hits the hits the side. You've got the bearing in the centre that the, the little grounding brush sits on top of. Uh, stepper motor controls, the tricolour LED for the front, because they always had this little tricolour LED to say uh, whether it's reading or writing. So you could actually tell with older drives whether it was reading or writing. Newer drives that do have a hard drive light, just light up and say, I'm busy, go away. They don't really have that sort of intelligence that the newer drives do. Um, I need to find some flyers. Right, now I have some flyers. I can finish removing the second logic board. This will be uh, mainly the motor and stepper controllers as this is closer to them and has the motor and stepper plugged in. Uh, we didn't have the sort of seriously powerful embedded chips that we have now, you know, 50 billion in one function microchip. Uh, everything back then was a little bit older, a little bit bigger, but still very, very clever for the time. That's why I collect the older hardware. It's, a, it's really, really good stuff, and it was built to last forever. Modern computer might work five years from now, but I'm tipping most likely not. Older machine, however, will just never start. No, oh, this is actually quite a bit trickier to remove than I planned on. Right, so two brakes. Stepper motor. Ah, I have to put that one back on. Ah, okay. It's this tiny little thing for the head position sensor. Okay, so there's two solenoid-based brakes here. There's the the head position sensor that doesn't actually know where the head is. It just knows if the head is at either end, and that's about it. Um, so yep, this is the motor control board. And stepper control board, as you can see, there's a some nice heat sunk componentry. Again, isn't in modern discs; they're not designed to last. I have a I have a WD drive out in the shed. Need to replace the logic board somehow. Where the smooth motor controller chip on it has blown to pieces. There's just a big white hole where there used to be a smooth controller chip. Um, this was all built to last, you know, really decent quality drivers that uh, have a really good amount of heat sinking. Well, that's actually quite clever. I think they're FETs and there's two stacked, one on top of the other. Evidently, they get hot, but not that hot that you can't do that. Uh, this is the motor controller board. It goes with the logic board. And then here, you just have no basic head. Motor. Many, many, many more inputs on the motor than you'd find on a modern disc, which usually only has three. If you watch a video on Ed's channel where we hooked one up to the death drive, you can just see that's three phase input, and you can get them to spin and not die, no matter how many volts you throw at them. It just wouldn't die. Just pretty cool, actually. Um, so yeah, you know, it's bigger, it's bulkier, but it was reliable. This was reliable technology of the time. Um, Continue talking about it while I put it back together. Now, these were good. So, yes, uh, for those who see this video before Thursday, cross your fingers that I actually get what I'm trying to get my hands on for the 500 subscriber special. For those of you that were my first 500 subscribers, thank you very much for subscribing. Uh, I hope I continue to be somewhat informative with my videos. Uh, that would be awesome to be somewhat informative with my videos. Make me very happy that people are learning 
some of the completely useless knowledge stored inside my skull. Um, but on that note as well, it'd be nice for especially to go through to older machines so at least some people you know, continue to know how they work. We can't let the old technology just die. It's, you know, it's very important stuff. It's, it's good for those now to know how we got to where we are now from where we were. Especially the younger ones who probably don't appreciate just how far we've come in how short a time. As this drive is probably from the mid 80s, which makes it about as old as I am. And just looking at it makes me feel even older than normal. It is classic stuff. Um, yeah, we've come a long way in an incredibly short time. If you think about it 50 years ago, this was just just unheard of technology. And it really is amazing to think in just you know, less than 30 years, or even, even just over 30 years. I mean, if you think about things like the Apple II, which was the 70s, now, could, could you imagine back when the Apple II came out what computers would be like 40 years later? You know, sitting here with essentially a small computer on a stick, taking pictures of stuff while I... And, and listening to me talk. And the computer will listen to me talk for as long as I care to talk for. And then I go to a, another computer and put all of that onto yet another computer over some copper pipes. Uh, we really are getting far. Anyway, um, thanks for watching, and hopefully by the end of this week, I'll have the new toy. Thanks for watching.